I think the biggest challenge is we're too rural, too far away from jobs, um, no transportation. We don't have any type of bus service out here for people to go anywhere uh, because of gas prices. And you have to have a car. You have to you know, have enough money to keep a car running to live out in a rural area. We are approximately 15 to 20 miles uh, north uh, to a grocery store that's a small grocery store from here. Um, a, a large grocery store, which is a Safeway store in Malala, is probably another probably 15, at least 15 miles from here. So if, you, if we weren't here uh, to help support them, they, they have to go a long ways to get food. Um, we're an outreach program, and we're basically a food bank. Uh, we started this a little different uh, than some of the food banks. Uh, we didn't uh, put a, a price on how much uh, money that you made a year. So you can come whether you qualify for USDA or not. Um, if you need food and you're hungry, then we're here and we're going to give it to you. We, we service um, all of the Colton area and the um, outlying little districts like backside of Estacada and Malala, a little bit of Canby, Malino, and up through Beaver Creek and, and through in there. So we cover a large rural Clackamas County area. We served, um, it was 7,700 families came in last year. Our average was like 150 people a week come in here, but we have had as many as 199 people come through on one Tuesday. Um, here a couple months ago, we kind of went through uh, a phase where we had a lot of people, I don't know what caused it, but we had at least 177 to 190 people every week. And it was, it was hard trying to find enough food to um, supply all of those people with their needs, um, nutritional needs. Um, we want to try and give them a balanced box um, to take home um, with vegetables and meat, dairy, uh, like sour cream and this sort of thing, and, uh, and dry goods. So, you know, we're hoping that it'll help them. Yeah. Um, are there any people you served over the past year of stories that really struck with you? Yeah, I have several. Oh, okay. I have one of a gentleman that lived in Molala. He had a family of um, him and his wife and two children. And I got a telephone call about 6 o'clock at night, and they said they had asked me if this certain fellow had come to the program, and I didn't know. I didn't recognize the name and I said well I don't know and they, she said he was pulling a little red wagon and so I started calling I got on the phone I called a whole bunch of the com uh, <laughs> volunteers and I said do you guys remember anyone pulling a red wagon oh yes they did he was here and so I called her back and I told her yes he was here and before I could get off the phone with her my phone was ringing again and uh, somebody has said, well, at 4 o'clock, we seen him at the Meadowbrook store. And then somebody else called and said, oh, we seen him about an hour ago at Maxburg Road. So I got a, uh, his trail and finally called his wife and told her that he was at Maxburg Road and um, would probably be home. It would probably take him another hour to get home. And he did. He got home at, at 7.30 that night. He had left his house at 7.30 that morning, and he pulled that wagon on these streets out here with no, no curbs, no sidewalks, just gravel on the side of the road. He had pulled that cart all the way up here and all the way home filled with groceries. And so we, we were so struck by it, and I was anyway. It just broke my heart to think that he had to do that. So ever since then, I go down and either take him a box every Tuesday or when he calls me and says they need one. And um, he also 
had told me, he says, I would like very much, he says, to help pay back by coming down and volunteering. And so he had come down and he has probably volunteered, oh, I don't know, maybe eight, ten times and helped us out. So that was one. And then another one that was heartbreaking also was um, a gentleman, um, and he said he had lost his job and he didn't have any family around here. And uh, he was sitting on uh, against the fence out here by, by the building when I came, and he had told me that he had been sitting there since 7.30, that he, one of the people that lived up on the road where he was um, had brought him down. And um, I said, oh, I said, um, oh, do you live in a house or something up there? And he says, no, he says, I don't. He says, I live in the woods. And I said, you live in the woods? He said, yeah. He says, I live in the woods in a tent. He says, I've been up there, he says, for quite a while. And so he came here, got a ride down here, but he didn't tell me that he didn't have a ride back. And I found out the following week when he came that he had taken all, all of these groceries and put it in a backpack and had a sack. And he walked all the way back to the woods. Well. So the following week, my daughter says, well, I'm not going to let him walk home. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take him home and take his groceries. And so um, she, uh, she did that, and she, she came back, and she says, Mom, she said, you wouldn't believe where this man lives. This is miles. It is way up on the very end of Schieffer Road. She says, and, and she says, and he says, you keep driving, and it's just nothing but woods up there. There's no homes or anything for a long ways. And uh, he come every single Tuesday to get food, and now we take him, we take him back home. But that was a long ways to walk for food. So we, we, we've had other stories of people living in the woods also, but it's sad. And we've had a lot of people come out here and say they're living in their cars. Living in their cars. Yes, uh -huh. we had a lady and a gentleman that were living in their cars that came in and brought the children and they had three children. The kids didn't even have any shoes and they said they were living up in the woods and she told me that um, the Forest Service uh, made a move every two weeks. They couldn't be like squatters, you know, in the woods. They'd come by and say, well, you've been here long enough now, you'll have to they'll have to move, and so they move from one spot to the other spot about every two or three weeks, I guess. <sighs> I mean, it's, it is heartbreaking. It is. I guess try and have some type of bus service out here so that people could get to town. It would be really, really nice if we had a daycare um, facility like some of the schools have where the parents could drop their children off and. Um, not have to worry about them until they get home. Usually, if you're living out here and you're gonna, you've got a job in Oregon City or downtown Portland, you're talking about half hour to an hour drive home after work, and so your children are at a daycare um, center a long time. But we don't have anything like that out here. I'm sure we have people that take care of children in homes that I'm talking about. Um, or they would have activities and maybe get a snack after school or something like that. And also I think that Colton could benefit greatly from maybe a boys and girls club where the kids could go um, and have baseball, basketball, and volleyball and this sort of thing. Uh, it may be in one big um, room or use the school or something, have, have somebody um, volunteer, chair that up, and, and then the kids would have something to do during the summer and after school. I think that they need that. Um, be wonderful to have a grocery store, but it just, it's not a big enough population to withstand having a, a big grocery store. <laughs> but it's the population isn't large enough to warrant um, you know, a business making a whole bunch of money. So.
It's very rewarding um, helping the people. Um, we have a lot of other things just besides food that we do for these people. I've had a lot of them tell me that this is their social hour. They love coming and standing in line and waiting and talking and laughing and a lot of them this is their only um, um, time that they get out and get to talk with their neighbors or uh, their friends that they've made here at the program. Um, we had one gentleman that used to come all the time and his uh, daughter brought him. And he passed away here um, this beginning of this year. And um, in his will, he had left uh, Colton Helping Hands $5,000. And we um, had the sign put on the building. We had been wanting a sign ever since we've been here. And so in his memory, um, we um, had the sign made and put on the outside of the building. And also, um, we uh, wrote grants, and um, we got enough money to buy that, that van that you see out, outside. And it was spearheaded by uh, Ken Calhoun, and uh, he passed away with cancer um, in February. So uh, we dedicated the truck to him in memory of Ken, too. So, uh, it's, I'm going to have to <laughs> close myself. I really miss him. He was just, he was a rock with our program, and, and uh, I, I really miss him. But i got to stop and think here a minute. We do so many things besides uh, food. We have um, a resource center that has everything on it. They, they can go out there on the board and uh, tell us a number. Every, all of our paperwork on the board is numbered. And if, like, like if they want to have their cat spayed or neutered, um, they can tell us the number and we can give them a piece of paper that tells them where they can go with the phone number. We have um, doctors, we have dentists, um, a, lot of, a lot of information for them to uh, take home with them and, um, and they can use. We've had people come and thank us and said that they'd had a terrible, terrible toothache. They called the number that we had told them to call. They took them right in and pulled their tooth. Um, when we tell everybody about the Providence uh, Dental Bus, uh, we've had several people here have their teeth fixed um, in that dental bus. Um, we just try to help them as much as we can with um, whatever problems and stuff that they have. Um, we have clothes and books, and magazines that they can take um, and read. If anybody donates anything to us, uh, as far as clothes or anything like that, we'll usually put them out front. Uh, if we have any uh, wheelchairs or canes or anything like that, we put them out front so that they can take them if they need them. Um, and once a year, we have a huge rummage sale. And we're ready to have our rummage sale the end of this month. And all of that money goes back into purchasing food for this program. We have a five-member uh, board of uh, real diverse people. We have young people, uh, old people, retired people, disabled people on our board. Um, and um, no one is paid this program. We have absolutely no paid um, directors, no paid board people. Everybody does this all on volunteer work. Uh, we have uh, 44 volunteers on our list, of which we use at least 44 volunteers a month um, to help us run this program. Um, people are very dedicated. Some of our um, volunteers have been here since we started. We opened our doors here at the community center um, in 2006. And we had, uh, I remember, 25 or 30 people come that first time. And now it's grown to 150 at least, 150 and more a week. So we have really grown since we opened our doors. Uh, we have um, 
The only way that we um, make our money is through public donations and grants. And um, Clackamas County commissioners, we have received several grants from them uh, to buy fruit and vegetables for our program. And that has helped immensely. Um, we get some of our bread donated from friends, but we do purchase our bread. Um, we get a lot of our food from Oregon Food Bank and also from Birch's Community Services. Um, and from farmers, all the produce and stuff that we have every week is, is, some of it is from Oregon Food Bank, but a lot of it is from the farmers in our local area. People will bring in cucumbers and zucchini and everything from their gardens this time of year. So this time of year we, um, we do have a, a lot of vegetables and things. Uh, I know there's much more that I should tell you, but I can't think about it. Great. <laughs> You did well, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.